The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show, Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, we are so glad to have you joining us. We have an excellent show lined up today. A segment of the ETF market that continues to grow in popularity is socially responsible ETFs. These are also referred to as ESG ETFs or sustainable ETFs. I think ESG is probably the most popular term. That stands for environmental social and governance. These are factors used to measure how positively companies are impacting society. And the general idea here is that as an investor, you may want to avoid companies involved in things like nuclear power or gambling or firearms or tobacco, or you may want to stay away from companies with poor track records on diversity or gender uh, equality. Uh, There are any number of different criteria that can be used. But the bottom line is you want to invest in a way that you feel is contributing positively. Now, in some cases, you may be doing so because you simply believe it's the right thing to do. And in other cases, maybe you think there are just better returns to be had by investing in a socially responsible uh, manner, or it could be the combination of the two. We have two great guests that to join us on the program today to discuss this topic. Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com, will join us in about 20 minutes. We'll get his take on ESG investing. Uh, And also, just last week, ETF.com rolled out a new tool to help you screen ETFs based on ESG criteria. So we're going to visit about that as well. And then later in the program, Bill Sokol, ETF product manager at VanEck, is going to spotlight the VanEck Vectors Green Bond ETF and offer his perspective on socially responsible investing. Uh, You know, Connor, last week we talked about the growing interest we're hearing from clients around thematic ETFs. So ETFs that invest in evolving trends, things like robotics and cybersecurity and social media. Well, ESG is another area where there's clearly a developing interest among investors. And in many regards, ESG can also be thought of uh, as a theme. It just happens to be much broader. There are certainly similarities with thematic ETFs and that they are looking to capture longer term trends that are playing out, whether that's you know, demographics in a particular country or advances in technology or medicine. And you can argue that ESG investing is a long term trend, especially among younger investors. But this obviously feels broader. You know, people want to invest in companies that make them money, but also make them feel good about owning those companies. You know, whereas perhaps, you know, a robo or a hack or another thematic ETF we discussed on last week's show might make up a small uh, sliver of your portfolio. More and more investors want ESG to encompass their entire portfolio. And we're we're not at that point yet where a viable ESG option is available to investors, you know, for every major asset class, but we're certainly getting there. And in fact, you mentioned it, you know, in just a second ago, we're going to dig into an ESG bond fund later in the program. Um, uh, so the ESG-focused ETFs are certainly an area where we expect huge growth over the next several years. Yeah, there's no doubt. The bottom line is ESG investing is only going to continue to grow in interest. You know, I think about the media frenzy surrounding President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement a few weeks ago. And with our usual caveat that we always try to avoid talking politics on the show, the fact is... A number of very prominent CEOs and business owners were very vocal about the fact that they intend to pursue business practices that align with the spirit of the Paris Climate Agreement. They came out pretty strong in disagreement with Trump. 
And I, I think a part of that is these companies realize that being a good steward of the environment probably makes good business sense moving forward. And more people want and expect that now. I, I think regardless of what the government does, businesses realize that sustainability is an issue people care about, whether we're talking about the environment, diversity, executive pay, whatever the case may be. And just to provide a little bit more color on Trump's decision to leave the Paris Agreement, Exxon, the largest oil company in the United States, actually came out against leaving the agreement. Uh, Exxon actually sent a letter to the Trump White House a few days before uh, the administration made the decision public to leave the Paris Agreement. And they stated that the Paris Agreement was, quote, an effective framework for addressing the risks of climate change and that the U.S. was, quote, well positioned to compete under the terms of the deal. So, I mean, think about that. We all expect, you know, the Teslas and other clean energy companies to support something like the Paris Agreement. But when Exxon is supporting the agreement as well, I think that tells you about not only the growing expectations of investors and what they're demanding of the of the companies that they own, but even internally in these companies themselves that people feel the pressure to, to be better stewards, like you mentioned, it, with Exxon obviously more on the environmental side of, of, of the ledger. Um, look, the Paris Climate Accord is just one recent example. I mean, look at the other uh, company making maybe the most headlines for the worst reasons is Mylan, right? The company behind EpiPens. And EpiPens are truly a life-saving product for those people with serious allergies. And the uproar about not only the massive price increases that Mylan has put on this product, but also the executive pay issues around the company. And people are mad. I mean, last year in 2016, the chairman of Mylan made $100 million in one year alone. And investors are upset. They want the board thrown out. They want the CEO fired. And, you know, when you have a device that saves lives, especially the lives of children, where allergies, you know, uh, severe allergic reactions are most common, and a company puts profits in front of saving lives, you know, that's an issue. So, you know, this is just another recent example of an issue that investors are caring more and more about, you know, corporate governance and, and exorbitant executive pay. And ESG investors want the companies that they own to not only do what's profitable, but to also do what's right. And it's becoming clear that these issues are becoming more and more important to, you know, a larger swath of the investor community out there. Well, and I'll offer even another recent example. Think about Uber. Even though they're a privately held company, some of the issues that they've had there uh, regarding sexual harassment and, and gender equality, uh, y you know, these are real issues. And sort of wading back into the political side of this, I do think it can be extremely difficult at times to remove politics from these issues. I, I think people have very passionate views on both sides of these debates. And I, I think there can also be some stereotyping around who supports these different initiatives. But I guess the way I would attempt to remove politics uh, is by framing it this way. If you think about a business that is really trying to do the right thing, right? They're, they're trying to run more energy efficient operations or make sure their employees are treated equally uh, or keep executive pay in check. I think you can make a very intelligent case that those companies are going to perform better over the long term. And, and think about it. They'll be less prone to lawsuits. Uh, maybe they don't get sued for some sort of environmental issue or uh, get sued by employees. Uh, I would think happier employees don't sue as often as unhappy uh, employees. And as another benefit, happy employees are also probably more motivated and, and more productive employees. Uh, from a cost perspective, companies focusing on things like not overpaying executives and having strong internal controls and good accounting practices, I would think they're run much more cost effectively. So if you just think about this at a high level, it would seem like over time, these companies would be more successful. Now, from an investment standpoint, there have been some studies on this, and I've seen data that does suggest there is evidence of higher risk adjusted returns from companies with higher ESG scores. But I've also seen other studies uh, that are inconclusive. And, and we'll talk about one of those studies here in a moment. But Connor, intuitively, it makes sense to me that companies with higher ESG ratings might perform better. Right. So 
you think back to the summer of 2010 and the BP oil spill in the Gulf. That was a unmitigated disaster from not only an envir- environmental standpoint, but from being a, an, a potential investor in BP and what that did to that company. I mean, the, in the aftermath of that oil spill, their stock price was immediately cut in price, cut in half in value. The company was cut in half immediately, and their stock price still hasn't recovered. It's still actually trading a couple of dollars lower than its price pre the oil spill back in 2010. And just to give you an idea of you know how another similar oil company's performed, Exxon is up around 20%. Uh, from its value before the oil spill occurred. So, you know, I think there's really the validity there of thinking that ESG investing can actually produce better results because BP was a company that had been dinged by regulators consistently for cutting corners, right, for doing what wasn't always right in terms of protecting not only their crew members and their workers but the environment. And look what happened as a result of them cutting those corners in this disaster that, frankly, that company will likely never recover from here in the U.S. Well, I mentioned there have been some studies on the performance of companies scoring higher in ESG factors. As it turns out, CNBC actually released a great piece on this topic just last Friday. They conducted their own study on the performance of ESG funds versus traditional funds, and they used uh, Morningstar data what they found was there there was basically no difference in performance between ESG funds and traditional funds, uh, with one caveat being that funds excluding SIN stocks, so things like tobacco, firearms, alcohol, they actually didn't perform quite as well. And, and then CNBC also referenced another study where they found, uh, quote, the adoption of ESG standards does not generate notable costs or benefits for an investor with a global perspective. But they also had a quote from Morningstar's head of sustainability research. Uh, He said, quote, the weight of academic research on the performance of sustainable slash responsible portfolios suggests that there is no performance penalty. So so, so let me back up here. What what this says is perhaps the jury is still out on ESG uh, investing from a performance perspective. But I, I guess one way you might look at this is if there's no performance penalty or drag but you can invest in companies that are doing the right thing, boy, that seems like a win. Right. And when you look at, you know, what was maybe previously called socially responsible investing over the past several decades, there was kind of a mentality of nice guys finish last. I mean, you were pretty much knowingly going into, you know, a socially responsible fund with the expectation you might not earn as much um, in a fund like that, but that that has changed, right? In the in the growth in the ESG space is has been phenomenal. And you know, although the mentality right now isn't necessarily nice guys finish last, it's maybe they finish in the crowd. Look, there's a, certainly a cost of doing things the right way. And on the other side of the ledger, companies that are cutting corners maybe don't have those costs. And and certainly sometimes they do get ahead, at least in the short term. And, you know, that's maybe why the data is is inconclusive at this point. But the thesis that ESG-focused funds will perform better over the long haul hasn't been proven definitively, right? But like you said earlier, Nate, intuitively, it does make some sense. I mean, companies that have happier, more productive workforces, reduced exposure to to lawsuits or bad publicity, you know, due to unsavory actions. I mean, this makes a lot of sense to investors, but, you know, we haven't seen it proven in the numbers at this point. But with all that being said, you know, there was a quote in that CNBC article you you referenced regarding ESG funds, and the, the, the article said this, quote, in the past, these portfolios haven't fully reflected the idea that it does improve an individual company's bottom line. But the ability to identify these things really only became sophisticated recently. The process of collecting and understanding information on company performance on ESG has definitely entered the realm of big data. Going forward, it may be more likely to result in outperformance, end quote. So the point here is with you know the revolution in big data and, and the amount of information that can be processed very easily by computers, this is going to get easier to track and more accurate to track. So, you know, this is this could be a real performance factor moving forward. But at the end of the day, where we stand today, 
ESG still does come down to your own personal beliefs. It's not a proven way to get out performance yet. All right, we need to take a break here, but as it relates specifically to ESG ETFs, as we mentioned earlier, this is no doubt a growing subset of the ETF universe. Currently, ETF.com lists 53 socially responsible ETFs. These cover a broad range of categories. For example, you'll find the iShares Low Carbon Target ETF, ticker symbol CRBN, the Spider Gender Diversity ETF, ticker S-E-H-E, and then even the Global X S&P 500 Catholic Values ETF, ticker C-A-T-H. And I should mention an ETF we'll be spotlighting later in the program is also on this list, the Vanek Vectors Green Bond ETF, G-R-N-B. But Connor, as we'll talk about with ETF.com's Dave Nodig here in just a moment, you can also now screen any ETF at ETF.com, regardless of whether it pursues a specific ESG theme, And you can evaluate how well the underlying holdings rate on different ESG metrics. And I I think what will be interesting to watch moving forward is how uh, transparency like this might impact where investors place their dollars. Because there's no doubt ESG-specific ETFs will continue to grow in popularity. But now that this ESG data is being made more available for all ETFs, you wonder if it will change investor behavior just in terms of uh, asset flows. You're right. It's pretty interesting development here because I do think the ESG-specific ETFs will continue to grow. But the underlying transparency of ETFs as a whole, I think, could drive further use of ETFs that might not be purely ESG-focused but do rank higher than their peers in some of these ESG factors. And, you know, think about the – Massive migration of investors away from high-cost mutual funds to to low-cost ETFs. I mean, the primary force behind this was transparency. It's so easy to hop online now and immediately see what your investments cost you, and that wasn't the case 10 years ago. It took a lot of work to find out what you were paying in fees before all this was so easily found online. And I think a similar trend could happen with ESG rankings. I mean, again, because ETF holdings are disclosed on a daily basis – you know exactly what you own. And with tools like what ETF.com just launched, you know, allowing you to screen any ETF for ESG rankings, I think something similar could happen with investors migrating towards ESG investments. You know, perhaps not a pure ESG focused fund, but, you know, for instance, you look at two US small cap ETFs and one has a higher ESG score than another similar one. I can see investors, you know, using that as one of their final decision points in deciding where they put their money. And I think that scenario is pretty likely, in my opinion, with some of the tools that are being launched, you know, just like the one that we're going to dig into here in a moment with Dave. So, look, I mean, as a whole, I think we're going to continue to hear more and more about ESG investing as it becomes more mainstream, Nate. And I think it's certainly going to be a topic that we're going to continually revisit on the show. All right, well, let's take a break here, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Dave Nodig, CEO of ETF.com. We'll continue our discussion on ESG investing, and then later, VanX Bill Sokol will spotlight the VanX Vectors Green Bond ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show, Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. The focus of our show today is on socially responsible investing, and I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Dave Nodig, CEO of ETF.com. Of course, ETF.com is one of the world's leading authorities on ETFs, and just last week they rolled out a new feature where investors can now access MSCI's ESG ratings data. So you can now peer into any ETF and see how it stacks up from a socially responsible investing standpoint. Uh, Dave, as always, great to have you on the program. Uh, Well, thanks for having me back. It's always good to be here. Dave, as you may recall, uh, you joined us on the program right at the beginning of the year. And we talked about some of ETF.com's 2017 ETF predictions, one of which was that this will be the year ESG explodes. 
And you said at the time, the question is whether ESG explodes from an asset standpoint uh, or a new launches perspective. And obviously, we're now uh, about six months into the year. I'm curious, how does this prediction look so far? And is there anything that surprised you, whether positively or negatively? Um, well, you know, the we haven't seen assets explode. Uh, that might be a bit of an exaggeration. We do have, uh, you know, a dozen funds or so now that are hovering around a billion dollars, which is certainly enough money to start taking it seriously. We've definitely seen a lot of product launches, though. We've had whole new players come in. Nuveen came in with a, a seven-product suite of uh, ESG funds covering pretty much the full spectrum, small cap, emerging markets, everything in the middle. Um, we've seen Oppenheimer come out with their uh, ESG revenue ETF. We've seen a variety of sort of smaller entrants in the space, and we've seen, uh, you know, some of the bigger players, uh, you know, weighed in as well, whether it's things like uh, Vanex Green Bond ETF. So we've, we've had maybe uh, over the past 12 months maybe 20 or so uh, product launches, and most of them are doing quite well. Dave, as you look at the growing interest overall in ESG, what are some of the key drivers here? Why is this becoming a, a bigger focus, uh, both from the fund company uh, standpoint, but also uh, from investor demand? Well, you know, we're in the midst of this $30 trillion uh, hand down of, of wealth going on in this country from the baby boom generation to their children. I, I think sometimes mischaracterized as, as sort of a millennial boom, but it's not, it's not a bunch of 22 year olds in their basement collecting million dollar checks. This is the the 40 year old woman who starts going to the financial advisor meeting with her 70 year old parents for instance uh and now they're starting to talk about estate planning and and handing down uh, the accumulated wealth of of a family to a, a new generation uh and over the next 20 years or so there's about 30 trillion dollars in investable assets that's going to roll down through that process and that generation the people who are now in their 40s um, express in surveys and with their dollars that they want their money to not just earn something, they want their money to do something. Uh, and so this generational shift really, I think, is behind this. Because it's a generational shift, it's not like it's going to be $30 trillion on one day, right? This is going to be an investment for the long term for these issuers. So they want to get out early. They want to develop track record. They want to be there for when those conversations start happening. Dave, when it comes to ESG investing, obviously some investors simply want to do the right thing with their money, right? They want to invest in companies they believe are pursuing the right values ethically. But I think other investors believe companies with higher ESG ratings might produce uh, higher returns. Connor and I actually mentioned a study earlier from CNBC, which I would say was largely inconclusive as it relates to performance. Yeah. But, but I'm curious, have you seen any data out there regarding performance uh, on companies rating high in ESG factors? And should performance be a reason to invest in ESG-focused ETFs? Yeah, there's a lot of research going on right now about whether, uh, whether, you know, ESG factors are factors in the sense that small cap or momentum are factors, and therefore can you build some sort of black box smart beta portfolio that includes those factors and, and magically gets you risk adjusted outperformance. You know, I don't think there's a free lunch anywhere in the factor and smart beta investing space. The research that I've seen that I, I believe most suggests that they're really different kinds of ESG factors. ESG is a big umbrella. We're talking about everything from people who are investing based on their religious values to clean energy. And that's a very broad swath of things to put under one umbrella. Uh, there is evidence and there's product out there that suggests when you focus on the governance issues, whether that's diversity uh, on boards, whether that's uh, you know labor policies, whether that's uh, you know, how they deal with activists. When you focus on those governance issues, there is evidence that, that firms that rate highly on good governance practices do outperform. We have, a, we have a great example in the market right now, EQLT, which is the Workplace Equality Portfolio. Um, that's really a global equity portfolio that focuses on representation of uh, and, and policies around LGBT uh, workers in the workplace. And that fund has managed to be ACWI uh, pretty handily for the last uh, for the last year. Uh, it's not, it hasn't been out for all that long. Um, but that fund is eking out that performance. It's up 3% something over the S&P over the last year. We've seen the same thing with the gender diversity ETF. So there's, there is alpha to be had there. You just have to be careful which one you're picking. 
Our guest today is Dave Nuttig, CEO of ETF.com. Dave, ETF.com recently rolled out a new feature where investors can now easily access MSCI's ESG ratings data for a number of ETFs. And so for our listeners, if you go to the fund page for an ETF by simply typing ETF.com slash whatever the ticker symbol is for a particular ETF, uh, so ETF.com slash IVV for the iShares S&P 500 ETF. From that fund page, you can now view a variety of ESG uh, metrics. Uh, Dave, tell us more about this data. What will investors now find? Yeah, so we partnered with MSCI, uh, who, who calculates some, I think, 400 statistics around every company uh, that they cover, which is thousands and thousands of companies around the world. They then roll those up into sort of fund ratings, and they really broadly come into a couple of different categories. Um, and, and you can find this on the FIT section, which is where we do portfolio analysis for a fund. Um, the first thing they look at is, is uh, you know, sort of thin stocks, so, you know, companies that are invested in tobacco and alcohol and making landmines and all these things that people are generally trying to avoid when they come in. That's what they call their, their screening exposure, how, how, how exposed is this portfolio to these thin stocks. And that just gives you a nice simple percentage, right? So the S&P 500 is about 12% in thin stocks. You can now see that and you can compare funds. Um, we think that's useful for investors. The other important flip side of that is investing in things that are positive, right? renewable energy, clean water, uh, sustainable investment practices, sustainable farming practices. That's what they call their impact solution score. And that you can get another percentage and say what percentage of the revenue in this fund is being generated from these you know, beneficial activities. In, in the case of the S&P 500, for example, that's 6%. So now you can compare a bunch of funds on an even playing field. And that's really the idea here, not so much to just pick out the one fund that may be, you know, most clean for clean energy, but to really compare your, your everyday funds against each other to know what you're buying. Now, is this uh, data provided for bond ETFs as well, or is it just stock ETFs? It is. It's, we have, the, the MSCI is covering about 1,300 funds right now out of the universe of about 2,000, which is most of the stock and bond universe. Um, you know, it, it's obviously a little bit trickier on the, on the bond side. We do now have actually a Vanna clean bond ETF out there or a green bond ETF out there. That tends to be mostly by looking at the, the corporate issuer the way you would look at the company um, and, and is most relevant in the corporate space. A little bit less interesting if you're buying a treasury fund. Dave, in terms of what investors may do with this uh, data, you, you know, earlier in the show, Connor made an interesting point. Uh, he mentioned how, uh, obviously, the increased transparency around investment costs uh, has clearly impacted investor behavior, right? We've, we've all seen the flows into low-cost funds. Mm -hmm. and, and so he made the point that perhaps increased transparency surrounding ESG data uh, will also change investor behavior. I, I'm curious, what do you think about that? I, I absolutely think so. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons we wanted to really partner with somebody to start servicing this data was precisely to have this conversation so that people, um, whether they think of themselves as a socially responsible investor or not, when they're evaluating, say, two or three different funds for their large cap equity exposure, this becomes another data point that they can look at. And I think a lot of investors make the, the false assumption that all funds tracking the same part of the market are, are basically the same, so just pick the cheapest one. Um, you and I both know that's not true. There are real portfolio differences, those impact performance, and they also have different ESG implications. And I think this just helps to be part of the conversation. Now, are there any other uh, bells or whistles uh, regarding ESG data that you envision providing to investors at ETF.com? What, what could be next here? Well, the, the other thing that we have put in place already is, uh, you know, if you go to our pages, you see a big, uh, you know, a big logo that says what the score of a fund is. We also now put up a badge if the fund is in the top 20% of its peer group on ESG scores, just to, to sort of quickly highlight those things. Um, I'm, I'd be reluctant to roll out too much of this data. Like I said, MSCI produces 400 pieces of data. Uh, we're not going to surface all of that. I think that would be a little overwhelming for most investors. So I think what you'll see us do over the next six 
six months to a year, is use the tools that we've put up there, these sort of six key metrics, to start talking about uh, how to incorporate an ESG component into your decision making. And I think that's how most investors uh, can and probably should approach this, not to just blindly say, I only invest in ESG uh, and therefore end up in a portfolio that's nothing but solar stocks. That's not great investing, but to incorporate ESG into the decision making process. So we're going to help work with investors to show how to do that. Well, Dave, I thought that was perfectly put. Uh, we will have to leave it there. As always, we greatly appreciate you joining us on the program and uh, keep up the tremendous work over at ETF.com. We're certainly big fans of the uh, website, so thank you for that well, as well. Big, big fans of yours as well, so thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. That was Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. And again, if you want to access the MSCI ESG data for uh, an ETF, there are two very easy ways to do so. You can either type ETF.com slash the ticker symbol of whatever ETF you want to evaluate, or you can view the ESG data using ETF.com's ETF screener tool, which is actually a great way to just compare ESG factors across different uh, ETFs. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, We'll be joined by Bill Sokol, ETF product manager at Van Eck. We'll spotlight the Van Eck Vectors Green Bond ETF and hear his take on the growth of socially responsible investing. We'll do that right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature, AC, and Connor Kelly in studio. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 2,000 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Van Eck Vectors Green Bond ETF, ticker symbol GRNB. This is the first U.S.-listed fixed-income ETF offering exposure to the green bond category. And joining us via phone from New York to discuss this ETF is Bill Sokol, ETF Product Manager at Van Eck. Uh, Bill, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Uh, thanks, Nate. Great to be here. Uh, Bill, my sense is many of our listeners are probably unfamiliar with green bonds. Uh, so to begin here today, give us some background. What exactly are green bonds? Sure. Yeah, no, uh, it's a great place to start. So, um, you know, a green bond is, is really like any other bond, uh, but the difference is that the proceeds are used only to finance projects that have a positive environmental impact. Uh, so those projects could be things like renewable energy, uh, so, so solar and wind uh, projects. It could be energy-efficient buildings. It can be mass transit. Um, also, interestingly, it can be projects that maybe a city or state undertakes to uh, to build resilience to climate change, so to, to adapt to the changes that are already happening. Uh, but the focus is really on disclosure and transparency. It's, a green bond is not a new type of debt instrument. Um, it's just about disclosure. It's about uh, ring fencing of the proceeds and, and then ongoing reporting. And... Um, you know, I think it's important to note, so in, in the vast majority of cases, these are really just plain vanilla bonds that are backed by the full balance sheet of an issuer. So, so a company like Apple, for instance, has issued green bonds, but from a fundamental risk and return perspective, all else the same. There's no difference between a green bond and, let's call it a non-green bond, except for this additional disclosure that you get with the green bonds. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of, you know, who determines whether a bond is green or not? Because it certainly seems like there could be some subjectivity here. There can be. Um, so, so in the one sense, you know, a green bond is, is, is really defined, uh, or at least, you know, the market defines it right now as a bond who, who uses the proceeds that go to an environmentally friendly project and it makes the required disclosures. And that's what's called a green label. Um, so, so if an issuer believes that they're, they're, you know, financing environmentally friendly projects and they provide this information to, to investors, they can self-declare the bond as green. Now, you know, for, for a lot of investors, um, for ESG investors, uh, that, that's not enough. 
because you know you do have the risk that an issuer could call a bond green and then use use the proceeds for some project that maybe is not green. So so what we did with GRNB is we uh, it, it tracks an index, the S and P Green Bond Select Index, um, and and the way that green bonds are evaluated is really baked into the methodology of the index. Uh, so, so the starting point is to look at this universe of green labeled bonds, um, and just make sure that that there is the right level of transparency. But then, on top of what in particular, does is it looks to an organization called the Climate Bonds Initiative, which is uh, it's an independent third party. It's actually uh, an NGO that that's based in London. And uh, their their sole mission is really to help grow the global green bond market. And uh, it's an organization that's really taking the lead on developing standards around what green bonds are. So that would help remove this subjectivity uh, that you mentioned. So so what they do is uh, they they've built a classification system that includes projects which which are considered to be green based on uh, their research base and, and scientific framework that uh, that they develop with uh, climate experts around the world. Um, and really it's built with the goal of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions so that global warming can stay below two degrees Celsius, which is a goal that was agreed uh, by, by almost every country in the world uh, a few years ago uh, under the Paris Agreement, uh, which, which has been in the news lately. But, but it is designed around that goal. So, um, so it does include a specific type, uh, specific project types. And um, as long as the, it is flagged as green by the Climate Bonds Initiative, then, so in the case of GRNB, it would be eligible for index inclusion. So it really provides that integrity that I think ESG investors want and really need to be confident that that their green bonds uh, really are having the environmental impact that they're looking for. Bill, I'm curious, uh, overall, how big is the green bond market? Well, it's so today it's, it's around two hundred billion dollars of of uh, outstanding issuance, but the market's grown tremendously. Um, you know, this market really began in two thousand seven, so just ten years ago, with a single bond issuance in Europe from uh, the European Investment Bank, which is a, a supranational issuer. So, from that single bond in two thousand seven, which what we have seen is really exponential growth over the last few years. Uh, since 2013 in particular, uh, just to give you an idea, so last year in 2016, there was over $80 billion of issuance, uh, which d- doubled the size of the market. Uh, so, so now we're at about $200 billion. Uh, expectations this year are from anywhere from probably $120 to $150 billion of additional issuance. Our guest today is Bill Sokol, ETF Product Manager at VanEck. We're spotlighting the VanEck Vectors Green Bond ETF, ticker symbol GRNB. Bill, you started to talk about the construction of GRNB. I'd love to hear some more detail just in terms of number of holdings, if there's any uh, waiting caps, anything else noteworthy about the underlying construction of this ETF. Sure. So so I I mentioned uh, how the index evaluates whether a bond is green or not green. Uh, from from there, you have an eligible universe, and then there are some additional flat, uh, filters that are applied that are, are really built in to enhance trading and liquidity. So so you can kind of screen out the the bonds that you can't really purchase; they're too small, perhaps. Um, so so there's some size filters. The the index does require a rating. Um, it, it, they have to be bonds that are actually accessible to a global bond investor. And, and then on top of that, we do include a 10% issuer cap, uh, or I should say S&P includes that, that issuer cap, which we thought was important because it is still a new and growing market and you don't want to be overly concentrated in any one issuer. And, uh, and lastly, there's a 20% cap on high yield, which really we're, we're, the, the green bond market isn't anywhere close to. It's a very high-quality market, but uh, 
again, thought it was important to build in these safeguards because you don't know how, how the market could look in the future considering the growth that we're seeing. Um, you know, basically what you're left with is uh, so a very global uh, portfolio and it's multi-sector. Uh, right now in the fund, there's about 40, 41 bonds in the fund. Um, and uh, like I said, it, you know, it's, it's actually quite diverse. It's, um, it's multi-sector. You have you know, about a third in government and government-related issuers. You have about a third in financials. Uh, so, so banks are very large green bond issuers. And then you have a third in, in corporate bonds. Um, I think, uh, you know, utilities are, I think you'd expect them to be a natural player in this space, but you also have uh, tech companies and consumer-oriented issuers as well. Um, like I said, it's multi-currency, that, which is really reflective of the, the, the very global nature of, of the green bond market. High quality. Um, I, I, overwhelmingly, it's an investment grade index. So I think about 95% investment grade. Substantial amount in AAA, which is reflective of the, the large presence that supranational issuers have. So these are AAA rated entities um, that are very active bond issuers. Um, and basically, what you're left with is. A, an exposure that in many ways resembles a core global bond allocation, something like a, the global ag index in terms of uh, quality, in terms of yield and duration. You, you're pretty much, uh, you know, you, you don't have a substantial difference with the global ag index. So, so it's an interesting, uh, you know, it's interesting the way the market's developed. And, and as it's grown, it's really grown in, in terms of diversity as well. To, to resemble the global the global bond market. Bill, as I look at the top holdings in this ETF, currently the top holding uh, is a French Republic government bond issue. Uh, this actually comprise, comprises about 8% of the ETF's total assets. I thought it might be interesting. Can you tell us more about this specific issue? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so France... In just early this year, in January, issued a seven billion euro uh, green bond, which was by far the largest green bond issued to date uh, by by any type of issuer. Um, it was the second country to issue a green bond. The first one was Poland. Just uh, I believe it was December in 2016. So so a month later, France issued this their bond. Um, which, which was really uh, quite a development for the green bond market to see sovereign country, sovereign issuers enter the market. Um, so, so that was a very successful issuance. So, seven billion euros. They actually just upsized that and did another one and I believe one point four billion euros uh, within the last two weeks. And it's you know it's coming from a country that is really a leader in terms of their their stance on climate change policy. So I think the green bond is meant to be a demonstration of that leadership. Uh, and, and what that bond will go to finance is it's really a wide variety of uh, projects and initiatives in France. So they've outlined climate change adaptation and mitigation projects, so quite a wide variety, um, but also some projects around preservation of uh, of uh, ecosystems and, and also pollution control. We're visiting with Bill Sokol, ETF product manager at VanEck. Uh, Bill, from a portfolio standpoint, where does GRNB fit in a portfolio? Is this a core holding, and just what does the general risk return profile look like? Sure. So, so I, I kind of went through what the you know some of the main characteristics of of what the uh, what the green bond market looks like and, and GRNB. Uh, some of GRNB's characteristics. And so what you see is uh, now, uh, something very similar in many ways to a, a global aggregate uh, core bond exposure. So, so, you know, from a portfolio construction perspective, it, you can have a pretty seamless allocation within that core global allocation without impacting your risk return profile. Um, on, from another perspective, you know, if you're maybe you have a more U.S. centric portfolio, 
uh, it would give you the diversification that you get with global bond investing from exposure to to other countries, other types of issuers, and other currencies as well. So, so we see it, we do see it as part of a core allocation, uh, whether it is uh, coming out of a, maybe a, a global bond portfolio or diversifying your U.S. exposure. Um, you know, I think there's a, another interesting element with green bonds. Uh, from a portfolio construction perspective, which is as a risk diversifier, because and, and I, I'm not talking your traditional, you know, interest rate risk, uh, credit risk. It's what I mean by that is, uh, you know, with green bonds, you're getting a uh, broad exposure to global issuers that are really taking a strategic approach to the way they address and mitigate climate risk in their operations. And those are risks that you don't necessarily get. They're not necessarily reflected in, in traditional bond portfolios. I think it's, I think climate risk is not, it's still not really top of mind for many investors. But to the extent that you see climate risk uh, maybe begin to get assessed more by investors and maybe priced in, uh, I think green bonds can provide a hedge to the extent that those issuers are really being proactive in the way that they manage their own climate risks. So, uh, you know, right now, given that your your yield and duration are, are in line with a core global bond allocation, you're really not even paying for that hedge. So, so again, we do see it as uh, part of that core core bond portfolio. Bill, this is Connor Kelly. We're running out of time here, but one last question for you. Does the issuer of the project matter? For instance, what if ExxonMobil or an oil company, you know, had a project that was labeled green? Is it, will you guys will that still fit in the index even if the underlying issuer might not be perceived as a, you know, quote unquote green company? Yeah, so so that that's a great question. And um you know, green bond, the green bond market's really developed to to really emphasize transparency, disclosure, and, and it really all comes back to use of proceeds of a particular bond issue, rather than assessing the the operations of the issuer itself. So, um, so, so, so it's a very in, I, I would call it a very inclusive way of investing. It, it it's not the you know the exclusionary style of ESG investing that you might see sometimes where, you know, you exclude certain types of companies. With green bonds, it's much more inclusionary. So as long as the bond itself is financing projects that are truly green, um, it, it is considered a green bond. And, and there are several examples of, I think, what you would call, you know, some people call them brown companies issuing green bonds. So here in the U.S., several utilities um, so power producers have uh, issued green bonds very successfully. So Southern Power, uh, Mid American, and some others have issued green bonds to finance renewable energy projects. On the other hand, we have seen just very recently in a large European oil and gas producer issue a green bond that went to finance their their operate their refinery operations to to make them more efficient. And a lot of people looked at that and said, "Well, you're not really." transitioning to a you know a low carbon economy by making your gas refineries more efficient so so that was viewed very skeptically um you know our index and most indices excluded that green bond um again not because it's from an oil and gas producer but because the bond itself wasn't viewed to be financing environmentally friendly projects well, Bill, with that, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, just an excellent ETF spotlight today. I, I think it'll certainly be interesting watching this segment of the ETF market continue to expand. And I do think the Vanette Green Bond ETF uh, was a much-needed addition. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. That was Bill Sokol, ETF Product Manager at VanEck. And if you would like to learn more about the VanEck Green Bond ETF, you can do so by visiting VanEck.com. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFStore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. We have another interesting ETF spotlight for you next week. Brad Lamonsdorf, founder and president 
of Active Alts is going to go in depth on the Active Alts Contrarian ETF. This seeks to invest in companies that actually have large short positions outstanding and are therefore subject to a, a so called short squeeze. This is a unique strategy, and Brad is an ETF uh, industry veteran, so be sure to catch our conversation. Until then, have a great week, everyone.